Yes. Welcome from the IBA Tampa Bay, Florida chapter. This is our study group for August 2023. Today is August 3rd. This is our 85th class. We're working on techniques. We're going to be presenting two techniques today, business capability analysis and collaborative games. As you may or may not know, our mission here at the IBA Tampa Bay is to bridge the gap between industry leaders and business analysts by, perform, by building partnerships with professionals, educators, and employers so that we may empower, instruct, and engage the BA community. We have a variety of ways for you to reach out to us. This is our normal Thursday evening study group from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern. We have past meeting recordings at this link uh, that will be dropped in the chat in just a moment. We also have an IIBA site, two meetup sites, Zoom, Facebook, and two LinkedIn sites. If you want to reach us, there's ways to reach us. Our Watermark Learning is our sponsor. Uh, the reason there's our sponsor is whenever we're not doing techniques and we're not doing professional presentations, uh, we're doing practice test questions for the CBAP and the other certifications around business analysis. Watermark Learning has given us permission and ability to use their study test questions uh, so that we can use those in class. They also gave us a discount code, 20% off of any of their products, and that's Tampa Space 21. That discount code is good for any of their products, not just business analysis, and they have a variety of other topics that they cover as well as business analysis. Uh, the, our board is our volunteer organization that we that leads our organization. Our board is live, led by Cliff Gray. He's our president. Yulia is our vice president of finance. Caitlin and Priscilla are board members at large. My name is Thea Soren. I'm the vice president of career and professional development. If you need to learn something, if you need mentorship, if you need assistance, please reach out to me via LinkedIn. We're looking for a couple more board members. If you're interested in being a board member, we can use you for as little or as much as you would like to contribute. Uh, we This is a not paid position, but it's just something that is beneficial to our entire organization and everyone that we serve. We serve not only those of you who participate here with us live during our study group, but all the people that use our recorded study groups after hours we have people all around the world that contact us and tell us how instrumental this study group has been for them to get their certification, for them to learn how to be a business analyst, for them to just learn how to have more confidence in what they're doing. So reach out to us, either Cliff or myself, if you're interested in being a board member. And it looks really good on your resume. Uh, we have two CBAPs in house. Uh, Bob is one of our CBAPs. You can see him right here. Uh, he is Lean Six Sigma Black Belts, uh, CBAT, PMP, and quite a number of other things. He also has a fantastic website. It is rpchurchill.com, and he has a huge number of articles written that help you learn more about not only business analysis, but a variety of other topics. If you'd like to reach out to Bob directly, you can reach out to him at bob at rpchurchill.com. Yulia is our other CBAP. She, I don't believe she's here at the moment. Uh, Yulia was a student of our class and came on as a board member. As you know, she's our vice president of finance. But them attending our study group, at least one of them attending our study group, means that you as a participant of our study group get to use this hour as one of your credits of education credits as you apply for your uh, CBAP or your other certifications. Uh, we have a variety of people who have participated in our study group and gone on to get their certifications. We are very proud of every one of them, and we would love to document it if you participate in our study group and get a certification, regardless of the certification. It just encourages us to continue to go because, as you know, this is not a paid study group. Uh, this is a free study group that we offer. So now I'm going to turn this over to... Uh, Bob, and he's going to talk about business capability analysis. And then when he's finished, and I'll take over for collaborative games, one of the benefits of our study group is that we have audience participation. That means you, as somebody that's learning, is able to ask questions. You're able to uh, provide examples of situations that you were able to use this technique. We need your participation. We're not here to talk at you. We're here to talk with you. 
So Bob, go ahead and take it away and give us information on business capability analysis. Can you see that? We can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Let me uh, hide stuff. Hide, um, yep, there we go. So, um, business capability analysis is a way to um, gain a high level overview of a lot of things your business or organization is doing. And it's an organized way of doing so. So like a lot of these techniques, I've never used it. I never heard of it. But somebody thought it was valuable. And so they created this. It got included in the bad box. And once you understand it, it's not difficult to see the utility in it. Um, also, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I speak very slowly. Feel free when you are watching the recordings to speed this up like 2x. I sound almost like a regular human. So um, the main thing is to break down um, different practice areas and different sub-considerations into that using the following breakdowns. So you want to talk about business value and customer value and uh, your specific areas of performance, which may be gaps and uh, also risk. So this is one way to show this. Now, um, if you look in the bat box, and I think this is technique number six, you will find that uh, there are a number of ways to depict all this information. You can make a table or an outline or a spreadsheet and rate all these four areas, um, high, medium, or low. You can color code them. You can show them with words. You can have an X in a, a grid of boxes. You can show this any way you want to. The point is uh, about the information and the analysis and the shared understanding. And it's not about the specific way you represent it. This makes a nice picture, but um, there's an example of this in the Babak and also a much simpler example. I invite you to compare those. It's uh, it's always about the what and not the how. So, yeah. Um, so you want to do a number of these and uh, what it will do when you break down a bunch of major areas and then sub consideration specific things you do in each capability area. Um, you want to look at these all at once. So why would you do this? Um, a, you can compare organizations to each other. And uh, if you do that, you want to uh, use similar um, comparison areas in a breakdown hierarchy of capabilities and concerns to the greatest degree possible. So you're comparing apples to apples. Um, you can also use it to look at all the different operations and capabilities you have in-house or at 
uh, a customer operation to see if you see patterns of uh, larger areas that need work. Or you can simply say, okay, um, here are the problem areas. I can target those. Now, because you're considering four separate um, areas of uh, concern here, business and customer value, risk and performance gaps, um, you want to keep the scoring of all those fairly simple. So you've already got four categories of information. Then you have um, X number of larger areas of concern or capability areas. And then each one of those might have several sub consideration so you don't want a complicated scoring system i mean what's uh, you've got one two three high medium low that's all the um granularity you need what's the difference between a six and a seven who knows uh, what's the difference between 67 and 73? It's meaningless. So it's not um, attempting to be a super accurate detail down to the neat kind of analysis. It's a rough thing to guide effort to see where you should be um, trying to improve and or identify strengths to take advantage. Uh, so uh, the BABA example um, describes four major uh, capability areas. So those are having to do with the organization, uh, project analysis, professional development, and management. And that um, all kind of stays in sync with uh, all the things we do as BAs and organizations need to do this. But there are different kinds of organizations. So it's good to have an internal analysis capability. But there are a lot of other things you might want to look at. For example, if you have a shipping and distribution operation, you might want to look at um, um, shipping in terms of a bunch of subcategories, so routing and scheduling and packing and grouping um, uh, partial shipments on one truck and trying to make that efficient in communicating with uh, delivery recipients and so on. So the uh, examples in the Babog are illustrative, but don't feel bound by them. And um, also risk can be um, assessed across a number of areas. So uh, the bat box specifically talks about business risk, technology risk, organizational risk, and market risk. And I uh, break those down in more detail here in the text. So feel free to look at my website. It's rpchurchill.com. You can get to it um, by uh, going to the blog link, which is on the front page. Actually, let me show you what that looks like. There we go. So there's the blog. And uh, it just happens to be the first one. You can go here and search for these. Or um, if you know WordPress, you can go down to the bottom. I had uh, um, other links. Um, let me see. 
So techniques there, it should uh, have that. I'll edit that so you can find it. And that's mostly what I want to say. So you want to look at the um, these four areas across different um, capabilities that you have and uh, break them down. I invite you always to look at the Babon and uh, um, go from there. Are there any questions? Has anyone used this capability or this technique? In my previous organization, we used something similar to this, a, a, a fit gap analysis, which basically we used to identify the difference between uh, software that we needed to bring in, it was out of the box software, to what we actually needed it to fulfill. No. So. Gap analysis is a um, specific targeted thing. Um, everything you do in business analysis between what you've got and what you want, it's all gap analysis. Mm -hmm. So I've done similar things. Um, uh, like I often say, I can teach you to do my favorite swing dance in five minutes. You won't be an expert at it, but you can go and do the very basic thing I show you in uh, at any dance in the world where they're playing the right music. People will know what dance you're doing, and you can do it all night and have a great time. And it's really simple. But you can do the basic 50 different ways, and you can uh, add more to it and do variations and spend your whole life learning more and better. So you got to start someplace, and this is one of the some places you can start. It's a high-level overview meant to uh, look at a wide range of capabilities of an organization. Okay. And uh, one other thing I want to share with you. I dropped the link in the um, uh, chat. If you can see all the way back to the beginning, it's at 6.35 p.m. And it goes you to this, uh, takes you to this secret page. It's not linked on my website, but it is there. And uh, it um, uh, links to all the different recordings, what week it was, what we covered. It's all links to YouTube. In uh, times when we talked about individual subjects, and all the um, techniques are cross referenced. We went through it last year. We're going through the techniques again this year. I will make a similar table for the main knowledge areas um, that you need for the CBAP and the other chapters as well. Questions so on. Uh, Sorry. So I was wondering if my organization doesn't make use of the business capability um, model yet, um, who is responsible for building it? Let's say it's something I want to chip in. Um, who is going to be responsible for building that, using that tool? Is it me as a business analyst or everybody Well, you tend to employ techniques when you need them. So you would do this if you need to take a wide view of everything your organization is doing or your customer's organization is doing. Like I said, I've never done this. I've never had to um, get a wide overview of an organization like this. I tend to work more in the process level 
and um, uh, go deep into one area of something the process is uh, or the organization is doing it so I can simulate it, automate it, improve it, um, rearrange it, uh, reduce errors, improve the robustness of it. So all these techniques are driven by need and you use only the ones you actually need at the time. Okay. So you don't just go do all 50 of these things because they're in the book. So if you need to do an analysis of a, a specific organization or something, you could use this, check this out to see if this would be the beneficial technique for it. Yeah, so sorry. So this means that I can use this for benchmarking? Yeah, it's a way to do benchmarking. So it wants you, uh, that's actually a great insight by you. So a lot of these techniques are doing similar things, kind of coming at the problem from different angles. And if you understand how they kind of overlap with each other, that means you understand the material very well. So that's fantastic. It Thank really you. is. Any other questions about the technique? Okay, I want to I want to go off. Uh, go ahead. I would like to ask, um, which knowledge area, um, can we use this technique, like, uh, in strategy analysis, or in solution? Um, there is, um, there's a table someplace or a list of where you use all the um. BA techniques. So they're listed under the subheadings wherever they're used. At some point, when I was studying for my exam, I made a table of uh, when they applied to all the knowledge areas and all the specific activities within the knowledge areas. And there were two listings and they didn't quite agree with each other. There were like three tiny disagreements. So I wrote those up and sent them to the IIBA. This was six years ago, and they're listed as errata. They hopefully will be fixed in the next edition. So um, I may be able to uh, do a cross-reference on this website someplace, but the information is in there. And the other thing, when you really understand what these are for, um, it's kind of clear uh, when you would do these things. Uh, so you might do this during, um, remember that business analysis is um, about how you solve you know, specific problems and build systems or improve um, things that are going on now. But they're also about how to improve your working environment as a BA, how you do your engagement process. And also, you can use uh, many of these techniques to uh, analyze it and improve your working environment, the environment of the whole organization. So um, uh, all these techniques have different applicabilities and anything that makes sense, uh, go ahead and do it. Right, Cynthia posted a really great link from Modern Analyst. And it states that this technique is beneficial, is specific to strategy analysis. But one yeah, thing I'll go ahead. Strategy uh, in the Babog, I think, is when you're trying to get from your design, um, which is based on your requirements, to the implemented state. 
And so it's how you're going to roll it out and get from here to there. I think it's wider than that, the way I think about it. Um, and I think about all this using slightly different words, but strategy um, or um, this technique could be used when you're defining the problem to identify areas to work on. It can be um, um, done as part of uh, conceptual modeling, doing discovery and data collection to see what you need to work on, um, design to understand what areas you need to think about. It really could be very flexible. I know the bad bot makes certain links and you need to know that for the exam, but um, it, in reality, at the end of the day, we're after something larger here, which is understanding how to be great analysts. That's true. And I would use this in the very beginning of a project to figure out, do I have a problem? And then as you make changes, you need to keep updating it. You Any might other do questions? it as vendor assessment. You might do it as a, a, a part, a, an analysis of who you're going to work with or who knows the uses potentially are endless. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, let's switch over to the next topic. Let me share my screen. And we're going to talk about collaborative games. So collaborative games technique. Uh, this is technique number 10. And the quote I grabbed for it is when people feel like they belong at work, they're more productive, motivated, engaged, and three point more five times more likely to contribute to their fullest potential. Well, it looks like I um, cut off the, the top of this with this bar, but maybe it'll go away. Uh, according to the IBGA's BABOC, collaborative games encourage participants in an elicitation activity. So it's about elicitation to collaborate in building a joint understanding of a problem or solution. So it, this is a way to elicitate, elicit um, requirements and to get people thinking about the product and the project. Uh, it's several structure techniques inspired by gameplay because, you know, everybody likes to play a game, especially extroverts. And each game includes rules to keep the participant focused on a specific objective. Uh, they want to share their knowledge and experience on a given topic, identify hidden assumptions, and explore that knowledge in ways that may not occur during the course of normal interactions. You know, whenever you're playing a game, you're not you're not in the normal we're in a meeting or I've got to convey information or I've got to provide a report, you're, you kind of use a different part of your brain. And so people sometimes will relax a little bit. They'll laugh. They'll build some uh, common understanding. And it really will help in, in get, getting the team to bond a little bit. So not only is it good for elicitation, but it's also good to help people get to know each other. Um, different perspectives are come out. And it gets people to work together for better understanding of, of, the, of the issue. Uh, often benefit from the involvement of a neutral facilitator, which is important, who helps participants understand the rules of the game and enforces those rules. So the, the, often a scrum master does a really good job in this role because it's very similar to the role of a scrum master. It's the facilitator's job to keep the game moving forward and usually helps to ensure all participants play a role. So it's their job to say, hey, John, you haven't you haven't given us your idea, you know, to watch for people who are sitting back, either not acting engaged or maybe feel like they can't engage. Um, collaborative games usually involve strong visual or tactile elements. Uh, in a virtual environment, we can't do tactile elements, so we have to rely on other things. Activities such as moving sticky notes, scribbling on whiteboards, or drawing pictures help people overcome inhibitions foster creative thinking, and 
think laterally instead of, uh, you know, uh, linearly. So this, all of this was written before we had COVID, before most of us went uh, virtual. And so this is not talking about things that we can do virtually, but I've got ideas for you. So let's go into the next one. Uh, each collaborative game has a defined purpose and, and you don't have to tell the people what exactly the purpose is unless it will help you reach your purpose. Sometimes you just play the game for the game and then you say, and look at what we achieved and you can talk about the purpose then. Um, the facilitator helps participants gain, uh, understand the purpose if you're going to tell them and work toward the successful realization of that purpose. Some of the games, it's good to tell them at the beginning and some of them, it's not. Uh, each game has a process, a set of rules, uh, has at least three steps. Opening step, where you say, this is these are the rules and you start generating ideas. Uh, the explorative step where the participants engage with one another, looking for connections for their ideas and test those ideas, maybe experiment with new ideas. And then third is your summary. Whenever you uh, the ideas are assessed and participants work out which ideas are likely to be most useful and productive. This is what you actually come out of the game with. You choose your participants carefully because of, of that exact same thing. The outcome, the end of the collaborative game, the facility and the participants work through the results and determine any decisions or actions that need to be taken. So you go through the game, you get your new realizations and you say, so based on this, what do we do next? How, what do we need to address? What steps do we need to take? One of the things that this particularly does is it gets people emotionally invested. So because these ideas came from them, it's not this, you know, the boss told me to do this thing and I don't know why. It's like, well, I told them that this wasn't being addressed and and so now we're addressing it and I feel emotionally invested in the actual addressing of this issue. So these are three games and I'm going to give you a whole lot more in just a minute. But these are three games out of the bad box. So if there's test questions about these, it's going to be about these three games. Product box is when participants construct a box for the product as if it were being sold in a retail store. So uh, backstory, I used to work at Hallmark Corporate and we had customized products so that you as a customer could come into a Hallmark store and say, I want a story, I want a book for my grandson, John. He has blue eyes and blonde hair and he wants to be a fireman. So I want a book about him being a fireman. So we would, we would do this. We would say, here's a sign of that would explain what the product is. The objective is to be able to say, what are the features that we want people to see whenever they talk about this product? So the idea is it's customized for your grandchild or your child. Um, it, you know, and we would have some pictures of different people, the way that they would be in the book, things that were specific to that product to help us really focus on what are the things that we can market about this product. Another game is the affinity map. Participants write down features on sticky notes and you can do this virtually, put them on a wall and then move them closer to other features that appear similar in some way. So you basically are able to group your features. Uh, this is used to identify related or similar features or themes. It helps people not have disparate themes. Everybody's going after their own thing. It's like, oh, all four of us had the same idea. We just hadn't talked about it in a way that made us understand it was the same idea. This really helps with team bonding as well. A third one is fishbowl. This is really interesting because who you choose to be the group speaking about the topic and the, then who you choose to be the group that's listening and intently documenting their observations about assumptions um, is important. The people that are doing the analysis, look for your analytical folks. Uh, often they're introverts uh, because the extroverts, you know, as an extrovert, we have to talk out loud to think. And the introverts think very, very deeply. And they're able to be analytical in a way that extroverts aren't. So choose who's on each team and then let the folks that are talking about it talk about it, and then the other folks quietly and not, not say, that's an assumption, just not document it. And then if you can, 
uh, for this particular game for Fishbowl, if you can virtually have a um, transcript of their conversation, that way you can talk, go through it and say, when you said this will happen, that was an assumption. And we need to talk about what happens, what, what would the situation be if that doesn't happen? Um, why do you think that's going to happen? When is it going to happen? Who's responsible for it? All of those things. Because in, in as a business analyst, very often we're helping the project manager identify what the next steps are, what the risks are, things like that. So identifying assumptions or perspectives is a really valuable thing that we can do as business analysts to help promote the, the project. So strengths on this, it may reveal the head and assumptions and differences of opinion because those things need to be understood and resolved. It encourages creative thinking by stimulating alternative mental processes, not things that they're used to doing in if you not playing a game. Challenges participants who are not who are normally quiet or reserved to take a more active role in team activities. Please be careful with this. If you have someone who is an extreme introvert, challenging them, forcing them to do this can be can backfire. You don't necessarily want to do this. So be very, very judicious on which games you choose and who you included those games in what role. And then some collaborative games can be useful in exposing business needs that aren't being met, such as identifying what assumptions are, identifying gaps in your processes whenever you're talking about marketing or such. And then limitations or weaknesses. Playful nature of the games may be perceived as silly and make participants with reserved or introverted personalities or cultural norms uh, uncomfortable. If you're working with people from multiple cultures, you have to really be careful about this. Games that can be time consuming and may be perceived as unproductive, especially if the objective or outcomes are unclear. If you end that game and you don't say the reason we did this or the benefit of us doing this is X, Y, and Z, uh, they're going to walk away and say, hey, that was fun, but that, was, that wasn't productive. You need to be sure that you have your management's buy-in and the reason and explain to them the reason why you're doing this before you even start. Because if people walk out of this meeting talking about this and management didn't know about it, you surprise them in a way that you don't want to have to explain. Group participation can lead to a false sense of confidence in the conclusions reached. Just because your group came to a conclusion doesn't mean that that's the last part of the analysis. You still need to do a root cause analysis. You need to investigate with your SMEs. You need to run it by several other groups to be sure you have the right information. But this may be the only place that you get the beginning of this information. So let me show you. Let me get to another screen here. Um, I did a basic, this wasn't it. I did a basic search for uh, collaborative games for business analysts. And I got some really authoritative sources that I'm really happy about. Uh, the first one is Adaptive Solutions. They have 10 ways to leverage collaborative games for elicitation requirements. So it gives you the background of collaborative games, but then it also gives you, scrolling down, um, examples of several games. No, I'm sorry, this just gives you the, the doesn't give you examples. I apologize. Let's move on to the next one. That one gives you the explanation basically that I just went all through, except with a whole bunch more words. Uh, the functional BA, I believe this one does have examples of games, same ones, uh, collaborative games in a, for in business analysis, the BA mentor. Here's one called Draw Toast. Here's the same fishbowl. We talked about affinity map. So Draw Toast, here's an empathy map. Here's an innovation game. And then uh, I've lost my other link. I'll send it, I'll post it in the, in the. Uh, I can think of some other ones. Um, 
So there's one where you um, use tape and little sticks to build the tallest possible tower in some insanely short amount of time. And the winners are never who you think they're going to be. Um, and there was one where you are trying to get um, all the members of your little sub team to touch as many ping pong balls as possible. So right. um, you have masking tape and you figure out a way to pass them from one person to the other in a way that where they can touch all the ping pong ball and then uh, the next person does it. And there is a way to do that some of these games have utilities, so they're actually used when you're solving a problem. And some are just icebreaker games to help people get to know each other, um, learn about each other's personalities, and uh, develop some camaraderie because you're working together. I mean, yeah. the exercise about affinity mapping, which involves grouping the post-it notes, is one of my all-time favorite group activities. I yeah. love doing that as part of design, as part of um, uh, classification, as discovery, as decision making. You can pair that with multi voting, which isn't actually in the Babog, I think. Maybe it's buried in something else. So there are a lot of ways to do these things, and you need to know uh, what they're for when you're using them. Right. Uh, yes. There's a question. Andre. Andre? I can't hear you. OK, um, according to the Babok, yeah. Yeah, hi. According to the Babok, uh, these, these techniques are specifically for elicitation purposes. However, there are so many benefits to doing these in a group environment, especially if you don't know your teammates, you're going to discover who's an introvert and who's an extrovert. You're going to discover who has a competitiveness in them. Um, you're going to discover who has a larger vocabulary in some cases. Uh, you can, you're going to discover how people work together. You're going to be able to discover who the leaders are. Uh, you know, you're going to find somebody who steps up and says, I can take that or you're going to discover these people are more comfortable sitting back. Just because people don't jump up doesn't mean that they are not valuable. People that are deep thinkers very rarely will jump up. Those introverts are not going to volunteer. They want to sit back and observe. But, you know, if you give them a different way to provide value, say, um, if you have an idea, drop it into the chat, you're going to find out that they do have great ideas. They just don't want to be speaking in front of a group. So give them other ways to participate. I've got two questions. Uh, Tejas? So can you say that, uh, uh, you know, you go into work and say uh, that, you know, in today's meeting, we're going to be playing a game. <laughs> and so it's just like uh, uh, a lot of suits just looking at you and just saying, uh, and, okay, so you're, pay you're paying us to play a game? Okay. No, so uh, that I think is really interesting, especially because, uh, especially because you, you're, uh, you get to set an environment, you get to set an environment where the business starts thinking about um, the business starts thinking about development, uh, uh, development of idea, development of ideas, core requirements that uh, core requirements that they that they envision that they they want us to map out either through drawings or um, mm -hmm. innovative in, uh, innovative games. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting. So so is it like uh, it's okay to to say that you know we're going to be playing games for for this meeting? Well, it depends on your cultural environment. Let me let me say it this way. Um, whenever we would start a new product at Hallmark, we would talk about who are the people that are going to be buying this and who, I mean, 
what do they want it for? Things like that. But you get the product owners and the marketing people in this meeting and they would say, we're going to do an activity. We didn't call it a game. We're going to do an activity and we want to design what we think the product box or the marketing poster is going to be. And we want everyone's ideas. What do you think should be on it? And is this big thing or a small thing? Should it be in the top? Should it be in the bottom? And mm. because, you know, they understood things that are in the top half in the middle are going to be the most important. The lesser important things are going to be around. And we talked about product placement. I mean, you know, image placement, word placement, things like this. What this does was, is it gets people to speak up and they're, they're like, nobody said this yet. It's important. I want it on there. So they, they speak up. So you're playing a game, but you don't have to call it a game. But, you know, gamifying things is a great way to get people to use different parts of their brain and to speak up in ways that they wouldn't normally do that. So if your culture is good about playing games, if you have table tennis and and uh, y'all play, you have a group that plays D and D at lunchtime and stuff like that. You might be able to walk in and say, "Today we're going to play a game." However, if you have a very um, locked down group, for instance, for, I will say that if you're in banking, if you're in insurance, and of just a few other government uh, agencies, you probably don't want to say we're going to play a game. You're going to say yeah. we're going to do a creative activity to help pull information from you. You know, mm -hmm. say it in a way that they understand, but you're still doing the same thing. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, that was that was really good. So so there were you're 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 basically asking for the requirements in a creative way. Is that uh, uh, one thing? Because I, I mean, you said image placement. That was I, I found that to be very interesting because uh, some of the things that uh, some of the things that come up some of the things that come up is is trying to delight the customer like cpoa where you want to delight the customer you, there's certain things that that you that you try to follow and and but how do you uh then how do you uh, go about saying this development factors will play into this development factors will play into that and then you can all automatically say okay we can use empathy map we can use affinity mapping or fishbowl or product box um uh, i think that was that was really uh, uh i mean that part was really interesting so um yeah thank you so much again thank you you're very welcome let me ask answer a couple other questions then i've got a few follow-ups sola you have a question yeah, it's just kind of a contribution. Is that allowed? Oh, Absolutely. Okay. We definitely <laughs> want your contribution. <laughs> All right. So um, thank you for, for sharing that because I was just imagining how I could use the fishbowl together with um, one um, demonstration that I learned. Let me put it that way. You know, um, just like um, Teja said, I always call it um, short exercise, depending on. So even, even if I don't say like a creative creative activity, that's one. Um, you can also say that we are starting with a short exercise and I normally just ask everybody to stand up. Um, but I didn't know what I was doing was, was using fishbowl, but now I know. So it's like trying to make people realize that um, we all view things in different perspectives because some are introverts, some are extroverts. So at the beginning of the workshop or whatever meeting we are having, we just want people to understand that first. So if someone is saying something that is different from what you would expect to hear. You need to understand that we are all different. So I, I start by asking people to take a pen and roll it from top. When you see it is going clockwise, then, then you bring it down little by little. And then when you get here, it becomes anti-clockwise. So the way you see things at the top, and when you look at it from the bottom, it's anti-clockwise. Anti but when you look at it at the top, it's clockwise. So that okay. shows everybody that um, we are all different. Another way I use it in, is when I'm trying to get requirements and some team members wonder why we schedule meetings with about four or five members of the same team when one person can just give you all the requirements you need. Oh, absolutely. You know? Yeah, so that's just what I always use also. And so I'm realizing right now that it's feasible, letting mm -hmm. people understand that the way you see that process might not be the way your colleagues see the process. So right. we need perspectives from different people. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Good point. I appreciate you contributing. Very good. Andrea, do you have something? Uh, yes. Is my audio coming through now? 
I can yeah. hear you now. Yes. Cool. I have to re relaunch my Zoom. So my question is, I have a friend who is uh, running collaborative games for corporate customers uh, as independent contractor. So, and that's actually, that's, that's actually his business. He has a few games that he runs. So my question is, what are the uh, pros and cons of running collaborative games? And I, I have to say the collaborative games are getting more popular now. So, <laughs> so uh, what are the pros and cons of running collaborative games by uh, by analyst himself or by uh, like independent contractor or whatever? What are the pros and cons of that? Well, because you need a facilitator for every game, sometimes having someone that's not part of the group is beneficial. Sometimes having someone that needs to be a leader of the group, you know, for instance, you have a brand new group and you have a project manager that's just, you know, just taken on this project. That project manager becoming the facilitator of a collaborative game would be a great way to kind of say this person has an authority. Um, if you don't need that, having someone outside of the group do the same thing would be great. Um, if you have a challenge getting people to speak up and you think that maybe the reason they're not speaking up is either they've been intimidated, they don't feel heard, uh, they've been shut down, something like that. Having somebody from outside the group is probably a great idea. And I would love to talk to your friend if you'd had them contact me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some organizations really like to bring in people from the outside to do things. Other organizations, they don't. It just really depends on the organization. Any other questions? Actually, yes. before we move the way, could, could you provide yes. your last name? So I, I take attendance so that we can keep track of your, uh, yeah. and give you the hours accordingly. And, Anybody uh, who doesn't have their first and last name in, please put it in the chat. Thank you. And, yeah, the and only one I don't have Jay's is iPad. Uh, Andre. Okay, very good. Um, let's talk about the size of the people, uh, the number of the people that need to be involved in, in a collaborative game. If you get too many people, it's going to bog it down. And so I would, I would really encourage you to make it somewhere between maybe five and eight. Uh, it depends on your culture, but five and eight is a really good number. Also, if you have a culture, specifically if you have a, a culture that people are very, it's like, I don't speak in front of my boss, you know, you defer to your boss all the time, no matter what, even if they're wrong, you need to get those people away from their boss so that they can talk. Very often people that know more than other people are not the bosses. So be very <laughs> judicious as to, who is involved in your game? Be sure they're not they're not too many people because it's really hard to get thirty people to all talk. You know, give everybody a chance to talk. Um, just from a project management perspective, if you're paying everybody say thirty dollars an hour and you got thirty people in there, you just spent nine hundred dollars for an hour of work that you only give them a chance to talk once. You know five, maybe six, seven, eight people max. And that way everyone has a chance to really talk. And it also gives those people a chance to kind of bond. Um, and there's a benefit to having, say, all the developers together for the first time in a, in a game. Or one guy who's a developer, one guy in marketing, one guy in QA, one guy in whatever else, so that they can bond. You know, they can say, well, oh, yeah, I know Dave, we were in a game together. You know, so you have a lot of thinking about who should be involved in each of these. You have a lot of things to think about whenever you say who should have which role in each of these, depending on which game it is. Any questions? Any comments? Yes, Bob. Um, hopefully I can remember everything you've been inspired in my little peep brain. I really <laughs> want to emphasize that some of these things are just for icebreakers and team builders. Some are real techniques for doing work. Like right. I said, the affinity map, I say use that every chance you get. That's fantastic. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was um, these come up in a lot of different forms. So I've 
pretty much never in my working career used any form of these. The only place I encountered them was in um, certification courses and things like that. There were more corporate groupy, groupy, different um, organizations work differently. I'm a hardcore nerd. I work usually with other hardcore nerds. And what we do for um, team building exercises is, is like uh, Thea said, we play board games. We would do... Um, um, uh, uh, jigsaw puzzles so somebody brought in these jigsaw puzzles and the whole office worked on them for like three months until we got these four giant puzzles done um going out to ski trips having intramural softball teams things like that or uh, golf leagues bowling leagues they're all a form of this um getting to know people building teamwork and camaraderie getting people to know each other there are as many forms of this um as there are people in organizations. So I always think of the um, ones that this technique is specifically talking about are consultancy driven kind of games. And there's a place for that. You may or may not encounter them. Um, and the key is always to know your context and what you're trying to accomplish. One final comment is that I've seen these done in a room of 30 or 40 people in a class, so the right context, um, because what Thea said is right in a working environment, because she is pretty much always right. Um, is But you still have to break it down into teams of a handful, because too many people can't really function together. So. Right. So according to the Babok, if you're taking the test, this is for elicitation. But there's so many other reasons to play these games. There are a variety of things you can use online to play these games. Uh, there's a, a retrospective thing we use that you can use it for this instead. Whenever you're doing affinity maps, you can move post-it notes around. You can see you can make different colors. You can do all kinds of stuff. There's a game called Code Names that you can play virtually, and you'll discover that you know this person thinks differently than you think, and it's kind of cool because you can say, "Hey, you know, you're really analytical in this area. Could could I ask you to use that skill in this other thing?" But you know, find the good strengths that people have and use those strengths, regardless of what their position is, regardless of what their title is. People have things to contribute. So see what they have. Okay, we do not know what we're going to be, what technique we're going to be working on next week. We do have a list of techniques that are available to be uh, reviewed. We want you to review techniques. Do the same thing that Bob and I just did. And it's, it's you know, 20 minutes maybe to do the technique review. You don't have to make a PowerPoint. You can open up the Babok and just walk through it with us. Show us any examples you have from real life. It doesn't have to be fantastic. This is your opportunity to contribute, but you also get credit for it. So we will post a link to the uh, technique list on, um, well, I think- That's the actually, list. So if you go to that link, you can see all the techniques we've covered so far in cycle two. It'll be updated every week. Right. So please volunteer to do these and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So what I need is for you to reach out to me and tell me which technique you're interested in, what week you want to take it, and approximately how much time you want to take. If you want to take 10 minutes instead of 20 minutes or 30 minutes for questions, cool. We can make it fast. But 
that would just mean that I need to schedule more people for that particular week. And that's absolutely fine. But I encourage you to maybe step out of your comfort zone. This isn't hard and we're not picky and we're not ever going to say you didn't do a good job. We're going to love whatever you do. So give us a little bit of your expertise, especially if you have experience with one of these techniques. It's true that you learn more by teaching than you do by just trying to learn. So help us teach. Uh, Bob has taken on a brunt, the, the heaviest brunt of our teaching, and I try to help him out. But we need your expertise. You obviously are all skilled in some way. Some of y'all are probably more skilled than we are. So reach out to me through LinkedIn and we will get you on the schedule. I will give you all the encouragement and assistance I can, and we can get you ready to be polished. Okay. If you have any other questions, if you have anything you need to learn, if you need mentorship, if you need resume review, whatever you need, contact me through LinkedIn. That's what I'm here for. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention and participation and contribu contribution to this. We will see you next week at the same time, and we will be weekly after this. So y'all have a wonderful day. Be safe and do good some something good for yourself, okay? Talk to you later. Bye-bye. See you next week, guys.